Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. How is your vision? How well do you see? Have you been to a optometrist lately? Have you had anybody make comments about your eyes? I have people make comments about my eyes on a regular basis. Uh, when I'm out golfing, I'll, I'll be standing behind somebody and they take a shot. It could be with a driver or with an iron. And, and I'll play with people who just don't have great vision. And they'll say, oh, I didn't even see where the ball went. And I'll, and I'll just kind of watch it. I'll say, well, it's actually just it landed on the left edge of the fairway and it jumped about two feet into the rough right by that tree. And they'll look at me and say, man, you've got great vision. And I'll look back at them and I'll say, no, I don't. Notice anything? <laughs> I'm wearing glasses. I don't have great vision. I have a great optometrist. I've got a great doctor who, because if I took these glasses off, I wouldn't see where the golf ball goes probably much better than you do. But with these glasses... I have great vision. Well, as we've been walking through the book of Hebrews, we're getting a vision of Jesus in in, in a time where we need to see Jesus with greater clarity. In a sense, the book of Hebrews is, is almost like a lens through which we can see a vision of Jesus. Our eyes may not see Jesus with total clarity, but the Word of God gives us a picture of Jesus, a vision of Jesus. And we've been talking about these last four weeks about how the book of Hebrews was written in a time where people were beaten down and discouraged and they were tempted to maybe kind of walk away from and sidestep some aspects of their faith. And Hebrews says, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Get this picture, this vision of Jesus and you will not walk away from your faith. You will not sidestep Jesus. You'll be drawn into his presence to live for him in greater, more passionate ways. And and so in the same way that the book of Hebrews was so appropriate and needed at that time in history where there was financial challenges and spiritual challenges and political challenges, it was a time when the world was in upheaval. We're in a time like that right now. And and if if you have a hard time seeing Jesus with clarity, then just basically say, God's given me a spiritual optometrist, a lens through which I can see Jesus when my eyes can't see him clearly. And I want to challenge you to keep opening the book of Hebrews any time you need to get a fresh vision of Jesus. And when you open the book of Hebrews and you begin to read it, all of a sudden you get this picture of Jesus and you say, wait a minute, he is God with us. He is Emmanuel, God Almighty with us. Does that change your perspective, your outlook, if you know that God is with you? It it does. It transforms your outlook on the world. I'm not alone. The world's not out of control. God is with me. Get that vision from Hebrews. When you read Hebrews, you you begin to understand that that Jesus Christ is not just the great high priest. He's my great high priest. That I can literally, uh, from a spiritual standpoint, I can go from walking in this world and all the challenges to be swept into the very presence of God Almighty. And I don't need a human priest or pastor to open the way. I don't need to, I don't know, be need to begin by asking some human being to forgive me. Jesus Christ is my great high priest. He's your great high priest. If you've received him and you see him as the great high priest, you have complete access to God Almighty. That's a vision of Jesus that changes everything. You can walk into the presence of the living God because Jesus Christ is your great high priest. That's the vision that will change your life. When you read the book of Hebrews, when you see this through this lens of Scripture, You realize that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and he has had mercy on us. That will change your perspective. Sins washed away, standing before God with no judgment through Jesus Christ, will that change your perspective? Man, I'm having a hard day. I'm having a hard week. I'm having a hard month. I'm having a hard five or six months. Yeah, a lot of us are. 
But Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, has taken away your sins and mine. And if we come through faith, they're washed away. And this Emmanuel, God with us, great high priest, Lamb of God, is the source of our faith and our hope. We learned last week that when you have a vision of Jesus, he shows you all those who've gone before, who've walked in faith and lived in faith and inspires us to walk in that same faith. You know what? When I take my glasses off, I don't see things as clearly. And when I stop reading this book and don't look through the, through the lens of Scripture, I don't see Jesus with perfect clarity. But when we open this book, and when you go to the book of Hebrews and lots of other places in the Bible, but wow, Hebrews in particular, vision of Jesus, vision of Jesus, vision of Jesus, and we begin to see with clarity and fullness, and it changes our lives. And so then you get to Hebrews chapter 12 and Hebrews chapter 13. And once we have this vision of Jesus, then all of a sudden we can start to follow this Jesus and walk on the path that he walks. We can see where he's going and who he is. So the book of Hebrews finishes by, by not just giving a vision of Jesus, but a call to draw near to God, a call to walk in the ways of Jesus. It transforms us. So a clear vision of Jesus, a truly clear biblical vision of Jesus invites us to draw near to God. When you see Jesus as he is, you understand that the way has been opened. Listen to these words from Hebrews chapter 12. If you have your Bible or if you have your tablet or your phone and your, your Bible app, open to Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll begin in verse 22. And as I read you this, I want you to notice this invitation to come, to draw near, to come. Because again, when you see Jesus as he is, you don't run away. You're not afraid. You draw near to his presence. So Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've, you've been, in Jesus' name, you've been invited. You come near to him. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. All through Hebrews, celebrating the past, the Old Testament, but the new ways are better, and they fulfill all of that. Then move to verse 28 of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, solid, stable, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And the picture here is not one that's, that's meant to cause fear and cause us to run away, but to see the power and the glory of this God who we revere, who we stand in awe of, who we understand made everything, sustains everything, and rules over all the universe. In the Old Testament, when the people were, were coming near to God, they would stop, and in, in some, some cases, even when they were coming to, to, the, to the mountain, when they were told, now, now keep your distance, don't let animals up on the mountain, don't come on the mountain, because, because God's presence is so thick and so powerful there, you can't handle it. But when you come through Jesus, with a vision of Jesus, and a relationship with Jesus, there's no more hold back, there's run into the arms of God. And then in his power, live for him. Be transformed by him. So here's a question for you. When you see Jesus, a clear vision, when you see Jesus, will you draw closer and closer? I hope over these five weeks, this vision of Jesus, God with you, your great high priest, the Lamb of God who takes away your sins, the, the one who instills faith in you. I hope when you see this vision, you just find yourself almost just, just reflexively, instinctively just drawing near to him and coming closer to him because that's what he wants. He gave his life. He made a way so we can draw near. And through Jesus Christ, we come to the Father. And so, so this beautiful Trinitarian picture of our lives when we see Jesus for who he is, when we received his grace, is that the Spirit of God lives in us. And Jesus invites us close, and through Jesus, we come to the Father. Intimacy with God. That's what he wants for you and me. That's why Jesus has come and given his life and risen again. So just 
continue to say, what can I do to draw near to Jesus? And when you find yourself kind of stepping away, when you find yourself withdrawing from Jesus, go back to the Word and get a biblical vision. We pull away from Jesus when we believe the lies of the enemy or believe the world's narrative. That God is angry with us, that God is wanting to destroy us and judge us. God wants to bring grace to us. Now, God is, is a consuming fire, and if someone rejects him, they have to answer for their own sins. But in Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away. We should draw near to him with confidence. A clear vision of Jesus. When we have this vision, it guides us to the best life possible. If you want the absolute best life possible, have a vision of Jesus, and draw near to him. Now let me be clear about something. I'm not saying if you want the easiest life possible. That's untrue. Following Jesus will call us to, to sacrifice, to surrender, to do things we don't want to do, like love our enemies and forgive people who wrong us. It's, it's not easy to follow Jesus, but it is the best way to live. No better way to live than to walk in the ways of Jesus. So when you have a vision of him, you can walk into this life that is better than anything you imagine or dream. I want you to envision a life where everyone lived this way, the way that follows God's vision. And particularly, I'm going to invite you to envision a life where Christians, followers of Jesus, live like they're called to live in Hebrews chapter 13. After all these chapters giving a vision of Jesus that he's better than the old ways. The old ways were great, they were foundational, but he's the fulfillment of those things. Better, better, superior, hold to him, see him, have a vision, and now live for him. So I want to paint a picture that Hebrews 13 paints that is so extraordinary, you'll find yourself saying, that's just not possible. That's not the real world. I had an experience that was very, very profound some years ago uh, w with a group of people where, where I was trying to paint a picture of what could be, and they would not allow themselves to imagine that things could be different than they were. I was actually in Geneva, Switzerland. I was doing some ministry there uh, for, for about 10 years. I spent time uh, every year in the, kind of the cultural centers of Europe working with a group of churches there that were doing amazing ministry. And while I was there, I had a chance to have dinner with these three people from, uh, from the United Nations. None of them were Christians, and they all particularly worked in the area of the, dealing with the, the global AIDS uh, battle that was going on at that time, profound, deep issues in Africa, different parts of the world. And, and they were, th these three people that I met with for dinner with a couple friends of mine were in that world trying to battle against AIDS. And so over the meal, I, I really prayed about it. And I want, to, I, I, I want to paint a picture. I want to ask them a question that I was just really wanted an answer from somebody who, was, who, who had the expertise to answer the question. Because I had this thought in my mind. What if people actually followed God's ways? Would it make a difference in, in all that was happening with AIDS? So I said to these three people, I said, you know, I want to ask you a question. They said, sure. I said, if everyone in the world were just to follow God's guidelines for how to live, if everyone in the world wasn't damaging their body by using I, sharing IV needles to do drugs, if everyone in the world was, was only sexually active if they were with a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage for a lifetime, one man, one woman, covenant of marriage for a lifetime, if, if they just followed God's guidelines for care of their body and how we behave sexually, I said, how long would it take for AIDS to be eradicated, to go away? And each of these people said, well, that's not possible. That's never going to happen. I said, I said, I know it's not possible. I know it'll never happen. But I'm asking you, if it did, if every human being just lived and walked in a way that was consistent with the will of God, I was just trying to figure out if God's, I wanted to hear them say that God's ways lead to the best life possible. So I said, but I, okay, I know it would never happen, but just, I want you to pretend, imagine. And they said, well, it would never happen. They didn't want to answer the question. I finally said, I said, you're really intelligent people. I can see that. I'm giving you a hypothetical construct, a what if. But I'm saying, I know it would never happen. And I know as a pastor that human beings are broken and sinful and we don't live in God's ways. But if everybody followed the basic biblical guidelines for care of their body and how they treated other people sexually, if everyone followed that, how long would it take for AIDS to really be stemmed and then begin to go away? And one of them dared to say it. They said, about one generation. And I said, I said, thank you. I said, that was my suspicion. 
but I wanted to hear from it. They said, but, but it would never happen. And I thought, I know it will never happen. So now what I want to share with you out of Hebrews 13 is, is what the world could look like if every Christian walked in the best life possible with a vision of Jesus living the way that God calls us to live. And you're going to find yourself in your mind saying, while I'm talking right now, like these three people from the United Nations said, well, it would never happen. People would never do that. Even most Christians would never do that. And I'm telling you, I understand that. But I want you just to, for about six or seven minutes, imagine if every follower of Jesus were to walk in the ways of Jesus the difference it would make, the transforming power it would have in our world. Because I, I can't imagine every human being following God's word and God's ways. Because till, until we walk in the power of Jesus with the Holy Spirit in us, we don't have the strength to do it. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you can walk in his ways and repent of sin and keep following him. So can, can we just for a moment, I want to ask you just to get kind of crazy with me and dream with me and imagine a world where, where, where the millions upon millions of Christians were to live out this call of Hebrews chapter 13. If you have your Bibles open, turn to Hebrews 13. On your Bible app, go to Hebrews 13. And every one of these things I'm going to talk about right now comes right from the text. This is the call on people who have a vision of Jesus and want to walk in his ways and live in the best way possible. So Hebrews 13, in verse 1, we're told this. Love one another. Imagine every human being in the world who loves Jesus, saying, I'm going to love other people. Who's, who's your one another? Everybody. To love with the love of Jesus. That would change your relationships. And then in verse 2, show hospitality freely. Imagine every Christian opening their heart and their home and their resources to be hospitable, like people did in the ancient world, like people did in our country not that long ago. But now we're also afraid our doors are locked and we can kind of push people away. But imagine if we showed true hospitality led by the Holy Spirit. What would that do? Verse 3 of Hebrews 13 says this. We care for those in prison. Imagine if Christians were to say, you know, I know that there's people in prison that, that there may be some people that are there wrongly, but there's a lot of people that are there because they did it. They were wrong. They made bad choices. But I'm going to love them anyways. And I'm going to care for them. And I'm going to serve them. We have people at Shoreline who do that. We have a ministry, of, uh, particularly of women, who go to women in prison and care with the care of Jesus Christ. Imagine if Christians actually responded to these calls of God. In verse 3, also in Hebrews 13, it says to support those who are mistreated. What if every Christian looked at groups of people and say, you know, that's a group that's mistreated. That's a group that's forgotten. That's a group that's marginalized. That's a group that's, that, that there's prejudice or hurt against them. If, if I could do what I could to support them with the love of Jesus, would that make a difference in our world? I mean, just, just let the cumulative case of all these things just begin to run through your mind and your heart. What if thousands of Christians in Monterey who love Jesus, who are part of Shoreline Church or Calvary Church or Monterey Church or other great churches, Cypress Church, great churches in our community. What if we live this way? In verse 4, we're told that marriage would be honored and that there'd be sexual faithfulness. Could you imagine in every Christian marriage that every husband honored his wife, honored her as a woman of God, respected her, was faithful to her physically, faithful to her emotionally. That, that, that covenant of, of one man and one woman for a lifetime was adhered to with honor. And every wife honored her husband and was faithful to him. Faithful in her actions, faithful in her heart, faithful with her words. What The world would look on marriages like that and couples like that and say, I want that. I would, I would give anything for that. There are people jumping from bed to bed and experience to experience and app to app looking for some kind of a sexual fulfillment. And if they were to look at couples who love Jesus, a man and a woman in a covenant, and when they wake up the next morning, they're with that person because they love them and they stay with them. People say, I, that's what I want. I want somebody who will love me and be there with me in the morning and not be gone. They'll know my name and I'll know their name and they'll know everything about me and they'll still love me. People long for that and God says, be those kind of people. Get such a vision of Jesus. Draw so near him that you can love each other in a marriage that way. The world will look on in awe of that. In verse 5, 
We're told not to love money, but be content with what we have. What if every Christian, and this doesn't mean don't work hard, it doesn't mean don't earn more, but it means don't let your life be about money. Say, you know where I am right now? Thank you, Jesus. And if I have more, I'll use it for you. And if I have less, I'll use it for you. I'm going to live for you. If every Christian lived that way, it would send a message to the world. And verse 7, it says, remember leaders and honor leaders. Imagine if every Christian looked at every person in leadership and said, how can I remember you? How can I honor you? Every school teacher honored by Christians in the community. Every, every first responder and, and, and person who works to protect our community honored by the people in their community who know and love Jesus. That would send a message. Political leaders prayed for and honored and remembered as best we can, even when we don't always agree with them. We live in a world now where it's hard to agree with almost anybody completely, but can we remember them? Can we honor them? Because that's what we're called to do in Hebrews 13. You can't do this without a fresh vision of Jesus. But this is the vision. This is God's desire. In verse 9, we're told that our doctrine should be pure and uncompromising. Imagine every single Christian who says, I know what the Word of God says because I read it, I study it, I reflect on it, and I follow it even when it challenges me. Again, when my desires and the scriptures come together and bump against each other, God's word wins. And we follow the teaching of the word of God. That would send a message to the world. We don't tear out this page and pull that thing out and black that out and say, I don't want this or that and and say, I'm going to ignore this. We follow God's word. That would send a profound message to the world. In verse 15 of Hebrews 13, we're called to lift up praise regularly, consistently. What if every Christian was just, was just moved to praise God and glorify God consistently? In verse 16, that we're called to do good. In verse 16, we're called to share what we have. In verse 18, we're called to pray with passion and with faith. And, and it just, you, you put all these things together. And, and I, I'm looking at this list in front of me, all from Romans, I mean, all from Hebrews chapter 13. So I want you to imagine that in a community like the Monterey County, in, in, in any part of the world, that everyone who's there who's a follower of Jesus had such a clear vision of Jesus, heard the call of Hebrews 13 to love others, show hospitality, care for those in prison, support the mistreated, have faithfulness in their marriage, be content with what they have. All, all these things were guiding our lives. What would happen? How might God transform us? How might our... How might our our witness to the world expand and be undeniable because we live out what we say we believe. We we know what we believe. We hold to our doctrine. It's pure, and we don't give up on it. We keep holding to it even when it's tough and the world pushes back. It's transformational. But I know what can go through your mind. The same thing that went through the minds of those three people sitting at that restaurant in Geneva, Switzerland, all those years ago, saying, but that would never happen. It's not a possibility. And yet just because we cannot maybe live this out perfectly doesn't mean we shouldn't strive for this. This is the heart of Jesus. So when we have a vision of Jesus, when we hear his call to live for him, everything changes. He shows us the way and he gives us the power. So Jesus, the way and the power, when we walk his way, when we walk in his power, it frees us to worship intimately because he invites us near. If you want to go deep in worship, get a clear vision of Jesus and walk in his ways. And he will invite you into a deep place of worship. Hebrews 12, 28 says this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Our God is glorious beyond description. Our God is powerful over the universe. So worship with passion. You know, how, how do you do that? I want to encourage you. Man, spend some time on your knees. If you're physically able, there's something about kneeling down before God and just surrendering to him. If you dare to do it, lay flat on your face and just lay yourself out before God. Find a quiet place where, where family or friends or the kids aren't going to bother you. And if you're physically not able to do it, just lay on your bed, flat on your back, and just lay out and say, God, here I am. I I, I lay myself before you. The word worship actually means to lay yourself out completely flat before God, exposed in his presence. 
and glorify Him. You can do that when you're quiet and alone. Listen to the voice of the Spirit, and when the Spirit prompts you, you know, that's enough of that in your life. I love you. That's not right for you. Don't go, don't go any deeper into that relationship. Stop that behavior. Follow what God says. Walk in obedience to His calling. And just learn to have unrestrained praise. Let loose when you praise God. Don't hold back. Whether you're alone by yourself driving in the car and you're singing praise to God, whether you're praying and lifting up adoration, whether you're with God's people in your living room, here in the courtyard at Shoreline on Sundays, wherever you are, to just lift up your praise and don't hold back. When you know Jesus the way and you walk in his power, everything changes. Here's another way things change. Jesus the way and the power shows us a lifestyle and pathway that we can follow in his strength. When you have that vision of Jesus, when you know his ways, when he fills you with the power of his spirit, then you can walk in a new way. Look with me at Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. Through Jesus, and here it is, with this vision of Jesus, walking in Jesus. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Here's a question for you. How can praise transform your actions for the glory of God? Do you understand that praise is transformational. That praise isn't just for the glory of God, but when we praise him consistently, something happens in us. I, I love the story in the book of Acts where Paul and Silas are treated harshly. They're actually beaten and they're thrown in jail. And if you know the story, in the middle of the night, they've now been beaten, they've been unfairly treated, they're locked up and chained up and they're singing songs of praise to God. How does that work? I, 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 would, I want to say, I don't think I could do that, but the thing is, I haven't been there in that moment. But some of you have been in those moments where you feel shackled and pain and difficulty. Where is this coming from? And you still can give praise to God. Why? Because you have a vision of Jesus. You know who he is. And so as Paul and Silas give praise to God and the jailer listens on and the other prisoners listen on and God listens on, an earthquake hits, the doors are popped open and a revival breaks out. That jailer and the jailer's family come to faith in Jesus Christ. Lives were changed because prayer was lifted up and praise was expressed in the midst of a difficult time. Praise can transform everything. If you're in financial struggles, keep praising God because he hasn't changed. If you're going through emotional turmoil, keep praising God because he hasn't changed and your emotional turmoil will begin to change with praise. It doesn't make everything better. It doesn't mean you don't need some help or some counseling. It doesn't mean you don't need to maybe take a nap if you're tired. But man, when you praise, it changes things. It really does. When you have health struggles, praise God. Whatever you walk through, keep lifting up praise to God. When you see Jesus, who is the way and the strength that you need, the power that you need, You learn that the resurrection of Jesus empowers us to live for him each day. When we see Jesus Christ risen and alive, when we walk in his presence with our eyes fixed on him, we we have strength to follow him, to live for him. Listen to Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, the resurrection. May he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. May this resurrected Jesus equip you with everything good for doing his will. The the Jesus Christ we worship died on a cross, was buried for three days, and rose again in glory. And that resurrected Christ can equip you, empower you for every good thing to do the will of God. We may look at this list of things in Hebrews 13 and say, man, I could never live like that. And we couldn't in our own power. Just like I can't see real well without these glasses on. But man, when I put them on, I, I, I have better than perfect vision. People are like, man, you got amazing eyes. Yeah, right here. This is why, right? And people say, you stand so strong. 
You follow God. You walk in His will because I have a vision of Jesus. And my eyes have been changed. My heart has been changed. My mind has been changed. I can see that Jesus and that resurrected Lord makes me who I am today. We can walk in His ways. And when we stumble and fall, He picks us up again and puts us back up on our feet, dusts us off and says, keep walking for me. And maybe for you, that's the invitation today is to get up off the ground. Don't wallow there anymore. And say, Jesus, I'm ready to follow you again. So how can we tap into the resurrection power of Jesus? And I believe we do that when we just get that clear vision and step by step, moment by moment, follow after him. Read Hebrews 13. Read it once or twice a day for the next week, if that's what it takes, to get to see that picture, that vision of what he wants for your life. We have a vision of Jesus, and he gives us a vision of who we can be in his power. And we start to walk in that. Jesus, the way and the power. Because of him, lives are transformed by Jesus to show his presence to this world. And I think you have that picture by now. Man, if Christians live in the ways of Jesus, a vision of Jesus, a vision of who we're called to be in Jesus, we walk in those ways, even when it's tough, even when it's difficult, even when we fall and get back up again, we keep walking in those ways. The world sees it. People are staggered by the beauty of a life in love with Jesus Christ. By by people who know what generosity looks like. By people who understand that all they have isn't just for themselves. By people who go to the broken and the forgotten and the outcast and the imprisoned and say, can I bring love and care to you in the name of Jesus? By couples who are bound together by Jesus Christ, so even through the toughest of times, they hold together. The world looks on and says, oh, could it be that life could be like that? And it can when we walk with Jesus and walk in his ways. I want to encourage you, if you say, man, I'm not sure where to start. I want to give you one practical thing. We've talked about this through this series. I want to say it one more time. Go on our website and go to the Good, good, the good Neighbor link and click on that. And start right where you live. Start right where you are. If you live on a military base, if you live in an apartment, if you live in a neighborhood, if you, wherever you live, wherever you are, say, God, can I have such a clear vision of you and a clear sense of your call for me. That I begin to walk in these ways that seem strange to the world, but they're compelling, they're beautiful. Who doesn't love goodness and kindness? Who who doesn't love strength of relationship? Who doesn't love to see compassion exercised without, without an ulterior motive, but just out of the love of Jesus? It is compelling. Start with your neighbors. Get to know your neighbors. Connect with your neighbors. Serve your neighbors. Pray for your neighbors. Reach out and pray for a chance to talk about who this Jesus is that's changed your life and watch what God does from there. One last question. What action and lifestyle change will speak to the people God has placed in your life? I want to challenge you to read Hebrews 13 and say, which of these callings am I kind of missing? Which of, this, which of these visions of what my life could be that I'm going, I don't think I, don't think I could do that. Oh, it's too difficult. I'm, I'm skeptical that I'll even be able to live it. Which one is that God wants to bring a change that when you begin to change in that area, the people around you will notice? Is it how you love others? Is that you need to show hospitality more freely? Is that you need to care for the most broken and forgotten people in prison, people who are outcast? Is that it? is that you need to model a marriage if you're married that has greater love and greater care and greater faithfulness and greater nurturing. If that's what it is, then go build that for the glory of Jesus and let the world see. Is it it that you have fallen in love with money and stuff instead of the God who gave you that stuff and you need to learn to be more content? Is that you need to honor leaders? Maybe you speak so badly of people in leadership because, because they're all wrong and you're right. And you say, I need to be able to speak with tenderness and some honor of people, even when I disagree with them. Would that show the presence of Jesus? Is it that you're compromising on some of the beliefs of the Bible and you need to hold to your doctrine and not compromise and stand strong on that? And I believe for the most part, non-believers who know you believe what you say you believe, if you hold it with graciousness but with firmness, that speaks to the world. Is it that you need to praise God more regularly, that people need to hear your voice lifted? that you need to do good, that you need to share what you have, that you need to pray with greater passion. I don't know what it is for you, but I know this. I could pick up Hebrews 13 after having this vision of Jesus 
God with us, the great high priest, the Lamb of God, the instiller of faith for strength in our lives. With that vision of Jesus in my heart, in your heart, if we read Hebrews 13, the Spirit of God's going to say, hey, that one's for you. Go after that. Grow in that. If we finish this five weeks walking through Hebrews, and all we see is Jesus more clearly, but we don't let that vision of Jesus help us see who he wants us to be, we've missed something. And so, God, this is our prayer. This is our prayer, that we will have such a profoundly clear vision of Jesus that that it's undeniable in our lives and undeniable for those who look at our lives. Jesus, that we would see you as you are in your beauty and your glory and we would see ourselves as we could be in your beauty and in your glory and in your presence, walking in your power. And then we dare to pray, God, transform us by the power of the spirit of the living God to be who you want us to be. That we would have the lives that are the best lives possible. That people would look on who don't know you and say, I don't know about this whole Jesus thing, but man, a life like that. How can that be? May we live in such a way, oh God, that people begin to get a glimpse, a vision of you, Jesus, as they look at us, and then we can point to you, and they can see you in all your beauty as well. To that end, oh Lord, lead us forward. We thank you for these five weeks, just this lingering and meditating on this book of the Bible. Transform us because of it. And as you transform us, transform the world. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. I want to send you off with a, with a word of blessing out of these themes from Hebrews. But I want to just give you a couple of invitations. If you'll linger with me for just a moment, I want to give you a word of blessing, but I want to give you a couple of invitations first. First, I want to invite you for the next three weeks to join us for worship and to invite somebody else to join you for worship. And and you can send them the link or you can invite them to your home and social distance and watch the service together. But we're going to do three weeks coming up on what it means to be a peacemaker. If there was ever a time, at least in my lifetime, that I look at and say, we need Christians better learn to be peacemakers. If Christians aren't the peacemakers, I don't know who's going to be. What does it look like to be a peacemaker In, in our homes, in our workplace, in our community, in our nation, in our world? where there's tension of any kind, and there's tension of every kind right now. What does it look like to be a peacemaker? We'll spend three weeks discovering different ways to be a peacemaker that will apply to every area of peacemaking, every aspect of our lives. Some kind of general in all of life and some very specific for this moment in history. I invite you not only to come and be part of worship online or on our campus, but invite someone to join you who would would want to understand what it means to be a peacemaker. I also want to invite you, if you need prayer, on the screen here, you can see there's a phone number and also an email. If you want prayer, please don't miss this opportunity. Either call in or email in, and we'd love to pray with you. If you're new to Shoreline, I want to give you a personal welcome. We're so glad you're with us. And even though you you are not here in this building, uh, you're, you're part of our hearts, so we consider you part of this community. And we'd like to personally welcome you. So just send the word welcome to the number you see right there and we will follow up and reach out to you and get to know you a little bit and answer your questions. And then if you have any questions, just if you're part of Shoreline but you're wondering about when are we doing stuff on Wednesday nights or what about children's classes or what's happening with women's Bible study, any of those questions, just go to email info at shoreline.church and we will get back to you with the best possible answer as quickly as we can. Thank you for joining us. I want to invite you now as we close this time just to kind of quiet your heart and receive these words into your heart and into your life. May you walk and live with a fresh vision of Jesus the Messiah. He is God with you. He is the great high priest who's made a way for you. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one who instills faith for you to live for him and follow him. So walk with a vision of Jesus and walk with Jesus' vision for you and follow him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when you stumble and fall, don't stay there. 
He's waiting to pick you up, to dust you off, and to send you on your way. So walk with Jesus with a fresh vision and bring him glory everywhere you go. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week as we worship together.